Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. Please remember to fill out the attendance record and if you could also please remember to fill out the program evaluation. Uh, our topic today is a pulmonary arterial hypertension and we have the good fortune uh, to have a speaker who's uh, incredibly well qualified to discuss the subject. Our speaker today is Dr. John Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott is a pulmonologist and critical care physician. Uh, he is uh, currently a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, he's been published extensively and uh, uh, has had over 100 papers uh, published in peer-reviewed journals and has either authored or co-authored uh, over 20 textbook chapters. And so I'm very pleased that he was able to kindly accept our invitation to speak today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott. Does that reach? Um, so pulmonary hypertension. Um, the, um, I have to be careful with the volume, sorry. Um, I think you've already had the objectives uh, shown to you, so I'll skip over that. Pulmonary hypertension, typically you're going to diagnose it um, by the presentation of someone with dyspnea perhaps by the appearances of this chest x-ray with the oligemic lung fields and the enlarged pulmonary arteries that you can see. And perhaps if you've got severe disease, you might see the characteristic uh, plexiform lesion on a biopsy of such a patient. The mechanisms by which this condition occurs uh, will include uh, the familial pulmonary hypertension patients who will have in six to 10% of uh, all of your patients will have this, uh, will tend to have uh, bone uh, morphogenic um, uh, receptor pro uh, protein uh, uh, two abnormalities, uh, which um, will in turn uh, initiate uh, a SMAD response. Um, the uh, alternative known genetic pathway for this condition, of course, is in uh, uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, where you have an ALK1 abnormality, which mediates through a similar pathway. Uh, it seems in the most recent data that um, the uh, microRNA is particularly important in this mechanism, uh, and specifically microRNA21, uh, 21, the 21 referring to the number of amino acids uh, in the uh, derivative protein. What about pulmonary hypertension and uh, its outlook? Uh, really, the modern era, perhaps, this being a condition that was originally diagnosed back in 1891 and first series wasn't until 1950 uh, here in the States, uh, that the modern era really starts with the NIH registry, uh, which demonstrated uh, markers of survival, some of which uh, uh, we use for lung transplantation. Uh, the uh, particular variables which uh, have determined survival have included uh, functional class, the presence or absence of Raynaud's phenomenon, its presence increasing your risk uh, of an adverse outcome, high rate atrial pressure increases your risk of adverse outcome, higher pulmonary artery pressure increases your risk of adverse outcome, though not to quite the same extent that the other variables do. And uh, higher cardiac index, of course, reduces your risk. So lower cardiac index is the, is the uh, direction in which an adverse outcome uh, might be expected. Uh, really, the WHO classification functional class, um, I, I only really put up just to mention that, of course, fatigue and chest pain and syncope, features of any uh, obstructive cardiac lesion, features, for example, of aortic stenosis as well as of pulmonary hypertension, uh, are incorporated essentially into the uh, NIH, uh, the uh, New York, excuse me, NYHA uh, 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 classification of uh, dyspnea. Uh, as part of the uh, WHO functional class. 
Well, there are several mechanisms by which um, uh, uh, agents can act in this condition. Uh, those include uh, the prostacyclin pathway, uh, the nitric oxide pathway, and of course uh, the uh, endothelin uh, pathway, essentially antagonistic to the nitric oxide pathway. And medications have been developed uh, uh, to attack each of those uh, mechanisms uh, pertaining to uh, the control of vascular smooth muscle. As you see here. Well, perhaps a case would serve to illustrate um, some uh, additional points. Uh, this is a 34-year-old lady who presented uh, following uh, her delivery uh, from her second pregnancy. And uh, unfortunately, as is not uncommonly the case, um, a family history of the same disease suggesting that she might well have uh, an inherited uh, disorder. Um, back in January of 2006, she was functional class 3. Uh, and at that time, she had a catheter with uh, moderate elevation of pulmonary artery pressures, normal wedge, of course, and really a, a very respectable cardiac index at 3.3 at that time. She was treated with IV troprostanil, uh, which is, of course, an analog, is an analog of um, uh, prostacyclin, epiprostanil, um, and um, really did quite well initially. Um, later, uh, bosantin was added, uh, and subsequently sildenafil, and the patient was listed back in 2006 for lung transplantation. At that time, she had a uh, relatively respectable uh, ax uh, uh, axis, and uh, you can see her V1 at that time really was uh, relatively unremarkable. Um, although of, of note, even at that time, she had mild sinus tachycardia, which is somewhat unusual for these patients. Typically, they will tend to rate control very, very tightly in the um, 80 to 90 heartbeat range for a variety of reasons. Um, by 2008, she was made uh, status 7, which is our uh, method of, in lung transplantation of, of suggesting that she uh, does not uh, need uh, a transplant at that time, that she's too stable. Um, but fairly quickly after that, uh, only three months later, she was made active again, and again, was class three uh, with uh, very significant symptoms. Six minute walk was stable, uh, but our assessment of her right ventricle and right ventricular end diastolic volume in particular um, suggested an unfavorable trend, and that's typically done by uh, a cardiac uh, MRI technique, uh, as that has tended to be a better method often of um, uh, assessing the right ventricle. In uh, September of 2009, uh, you can see uh, her pulmonary artery pressures had risen. Uh, and you'll recall her earlier cardiac index of 3.3 is now down to 2.1. Um, and uh, indices such as pro-BMP have also risen. And of course, she has, as a result of that cardiac index and rising PA, uh, a, a very high uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. And now you can see um, the sorts of changes that you um, sadly can often see in these patients. You, first of all, uh, will note the change in the axis, uh, the change in V1, with now really very prominent R waves, and the overall strain pattern uh, present on this electrocardiogram. Let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, this is back in February 2010. Uh, and you've got uh, both the uh, long axis view as well as the two chamber view. You're seeing some compression of the left ventricle here. The pattern on these um, ECG uh, echoes, excuse me, is going to be one of progressive compression uh, by the right ventricle of the normal uh, but uh, compressed left ventricle. Uh, and this is, again, uh, from the same time period, just showing the uh, massive 
uh, reflux through the tricuspid valve, and that, of course, is the M mode uh, there. Um, by May of 2010, the same patient had presyncopal symptoms, uh, and her pro-BMP uh, was little improved by all the efforts that were undertaken. Um, with a cardiac index down to only 1.9, the patient underwent an atrial septostomy to offload the right ventricle, a trade-off, in essence, between um, oxygenation of blood and the pressures to which the right ventricle is being subjected under these circumstances. Um, in November, it was felt necessary uh, because of uh, partial closure of the shunt between the atria to redo the septostomy. Um, and we also obtained a waiver for her lung allocation score, which brought her up to the 90th percentile for lung allocation scores. Uh, one of the challenges of these patients is that they can be extremely sick, and yet under the allocation system, uh, they don't get the um, weighting that they need uh, when they deteriorate, and in particular when their right ventricle deteriorates, which tends to be the, the core of the problem. Um, in December 2010, um, the patient had uh, two dry runs for transplantation. And I think you can appreciate by now uh, that really we're getting very little movement in the right ventricle, and we're really um, seeing a very compressed uh, with the um, displacement D-shape of the uh, septum uh, from the right ventricle into the left uh, ventricle. And again, you might notice that really the um, pulmonary artery pressures really haven't changed very much from February 2010. And one of the difficulties, and we'll come back to this, is that pulmonary artery pressures, although they're very impressive, tend not to represent very well uh, the severity of the disease, particularly in the later stages. So in uh, February of 2011, uh, this poor lady uh, had a right ventricular ejection fraction, again on cardiac MR, of 25%. Uh, from 190, uh, she'd gone up to 229 mLs on her right ventricular end diastolic volume, uh, which was clearly deteriorating. In uh, May, uh, her six-minute walk was getting worse, although uh, her uh, NT pro-BMP was actually somewhat improved. Uh, again, uh, not the best indicator of deterioration, certainly. Um, her, um, by July, she had severe hemoptysis, uh, was auto-anticoagulated to a level of 4.1, developed ARDS, uh, ECMO was initiated, and uh, six days later it was with, uh, seven days later it was withdrawn, and um, uh, really um, a very sad end to a very wonderful lady, and um, just illustrating the difficulty in trying to manage what amounts to a failing, left, uh, failing right ventricle under these circumstances. Um, this was her uh, ECG, uh, again, just demonstrating increasing strain pattern moving into frank, frank ischemia. Um, and you can see what's left of her uh, left ventricle under these circumstances. This is a 28-year-old uh, woman, uh, functional class uh, between two and three, uh, some symptoms, um, who had a six-minute walk of 300 meters, NT bro BNP of 400, um, severe right ventricular enlargement, uh, dilated inferior vena cava, clearly showing a well-filled uh, ventricle, and uh, right ventricular longitudinal systolic strain of minus 12%. Uh, for those not familiar with that measurement, anything less than uh, minus 25% is typically uh, abnormal. Um, uh, 
and you can see some of her other indices. Question is, you've got this lady, she's functional class two to three, what would you use as a treatment uh, for um, uh, her at this point? Would you choose an oral agent? Would you consider a calcium channel blocker? Uh, would you consider um, intravenous uh, prostanol or Flolan? Um, Uh, you know, some people have broken this down in a very simplistic way on the basis of um, the uh, level of the pulmonary artery pressure. Broadly speaking, I think it's fair to say that from uh, less symptomatic patients, class one to two, here um, you basically move in a diagonal direction. The more severe, the, more, the, the greater the tendency to go at an early stage to the intravenous agents. But of course, remember with the uh, epiprostanol, you're going to put a central line in. Um, they're going to be on a pump, uh, and um, their way of life is certainly going to be dramatically changed as a result of that intervention. So it's, it's certainly not a trivial uh, intervention. Um, as a result of a number of, of different uh, meetings uh, over the last 10, 15 years, the general classification of primary, secondary pulmonary hypertension has changed. Um, we typically used to classify uh, primary pulmonary hypertension as idiopathic, and all of the above uh, would come under the category of uh, secondary pulmonary hypertension. Um, that's changed a little, and we now have uh, many of these uh, conditions being felt um, as you can see, particularly the genetic and familial, uh, to be much more in the category of the uh, plexigenic primary pulmonary hypertension category. Uh, and instead, um, we have, uh, and that's the reason, those are the reasons, uh, the rationale of uh, the various meetings about that. Um, if you look at survival, in pulmonary hypertension, it hasn't changed a great deal uh, in the modern era, but we've become perhaps a little bit better at identifying um, those patients who are likely to do well or worse. Not surprisingly, patients with functional class four tend to do more poorly. The difficulty, again, is um, being reliable in our predictions, which, of course, um, is a challenge in this, as in many other conditions. Uh, again, uh, all of these um, uh, have been used to try to determine prognosis, but really functional class, uh, clinical status, um, and uh, echo data probably is, are, are the most reliable uh, indicators uh, of prediction of death in these patients. Other, uh, the, of the clinical variables, the things that you need to keep in mind particularly are uh, scleroderma or portal pulmonary hypertension tends to have generally a worse prognosis for a, a number of different reasons. Um, male sex, older age, perhaps not too surprising, and again, perhaps not too surprising, limited exercise capacity has a significant impact. And, uh, of the laboratory values, uh, underperfused kidneys and over-distended hearts tend to uh, indicate, again, a later stage of disease. Uh, as far as um, factors which are uh, least likely to predict death in patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension, which of the following? Right ventricular size, right ventricular function, pulmonary artery pressure, left ventricular size, or pericardial effusion. If we look at um, PA pressures and we break the groups into um, pre-symptomatic and compensated below functional classes, uh, symptomatic and decompensating, and declining and decompensating, um, if we look at PVR, it reflects those groups relatively well. If we look at 
pulmonary artery pressure, there's a little bit of a problem with the more severe uh, instances. And if we look at cardiac output, not surprisingly, as the composite of the, um, uh, as, as PVR being the composite of the other two, uh, it follows uh, to some extent the uh, uh, PAP. If you look at PAP then, it's quite clear that you can have the same value both in both second and, and third categories. Uh, you can be symptomatic and uh, decompensating, or you can actually be declining in um, the last stages of, of uh, your natural history and still have the same pulmonary artery pressure. Of course, you're all familiar with the sort of changes that you're going to see uh, on a, a biventricular view of the heart. Um, typically, this is the normal. Um, and, of course, with the enlargement of the right ventricle, you get compression of the left ventricle. Question is, which of these measurements is best able to predict risk? And this is uh, under conditions where, uh, as a, uh, just an example of one patient, uh, always with severe right ventricular enlargement throughout. That was the course of the right ventricular systolic pressure assessed by ECHO. This was the right ventricular uh, ejection fraction assessed by uh, CT and MRI. Um, this is the right ventricular end diastolic volume assessed by CT and MRI which we've tended to find much more helpful, not surprisingly, as you can see there, than uh, right ventricular ejection fraction. And this is the right ventricular uh, size assessed by echo, which is also, uh, when available, uh, very helpful. So in essence, patients don't die from high pulmonary artery pressures. Um, they die from the inability of the right ventricle to compensate that is essentially the problem in this condition. Um, and so, uh, to some extent, it's fair to say that the adaption determines outcome. Now, you can measure right ventricular size relatively easily, um, as illustrated here. Um, the uh, advantages, of course, of echo are that it's easy um, to uh, obtain, if nothing else. Um, by comparison with cardiac MR, um, it's certainly uh, a little, arguably a little cheaper. Um, but cardiac MR has typically been used for its more precise measurement of right ventricular volumes when it's available. But it's all about right ventricular function. Basically, patients die because their right ventricle fails, uh, which can manifest itself as uh, acute heart failure, or it can manifest itself, of course, as fatal arrhythmias in these patients. Uh, so another question. With respect to uh, right ventricular function in pulmonary hypertension, which of the following statements is true? Um, is it radial right ventricular contractility that's important? Is it right ventricular ejection by cardiac MRI? Um, uh, this is the gold standard. Is it, um, which people have suggested, is, uh, is it that um, ECHO measures the longitudinal right ventricular contraction, which predicts the risk for future episodes of right heart failure, or is it that RIMP uh, by ECHO ac ac accurately reflects right ventricular dysfunction in this setting? Which is the best measurement? I mean, is there a good measurement for right ventricular function under these circumstances. I think those are fairly um, self-evident uh, statements. Um, there is no uh, gold standard. Um, and certainly right ventricular ejection fraction, um, in our experience, has not been uh, the most robust measurement uh, for these patients. Must be me, sorry. Um, 
So if we look at right ventricular function by um, echo, unlike the left ventricle, uh, radial contraction, as mentioned, is modest. It's predominantly a uh, longitudinal contracting um, chamber. So basically, if you're going to look at that, you're probably going to want to look at measurements of the longitudinal axis, um, which, of course, would include um, TAPS. The trouble is, of course, um, it's quite prone to error. Um, you can look at RIMP, which um, is a global measurement of both systolic and diastolic function, interventricular contraction time and interventricular relaxation time over the uh, total ejection time of the right ventricle. Um, but of course, as with all uh, composite variables, it's subject to significant uh, error. And you can look at um, uh, velocity, displacement. Strain is typically, of course, uh, really looking at deformation. And, and the way we do that um, is by um, speckle tracking echo. Um, you can also use MRI tagging. Doppler-based echo and, of course, um, deformation. If you look at um, longitudinal uh, peak systolic strain, it's relatively sensitive uh, and it's quite prognostic in pulmonary hypertension. It predicts disease progression um, relatively well uh, in both uh, pH and in right heart failure, and it predicts survival. Right ventricular systolic train um, is uh, reproducible, correlates with echo measurements of right ventricular dysfunction and markers of severe disease, and it uh, correlates with pulmonary artery symptoms, as well as uh, specifically right heart failure and um, or cause morbidity, uh, mortality, excuse me. Um, and it's uh, above everything else uh, is valued because it has the potential to be an independent variable amongst uh, a clutter of uh, uh, interactive variables. If you look at um, right ventricular afterload, uh, there's a number of ways in which you can uh, try to measure this, um, but PV cap is probably uh, as reasonable as any. Um, the other um, uh, part of that question that was asked before was, um, what is the role of pericardial effusion in these patients? Um, it tends to be a very bad prognostic sign, uh, probably because it reflects high pulmonary venous pressure more than any other reason. Um, and um, rather than a risk of tamponade, which really is most unusual in these patients. Um, echo and cardiac MR findings that are associated then with poor prognosis in these patients include uh, dilation of both the right ventricle and right atrium and uh, an eccentricity index. Uh, the measurements of right ventricular function that were mentioned pericardial effusion, uh, right atrial pressure, which of course came out even in the original NIH study, uh, a delayed relaxation mitral inflow pattern, uh, pulmonary artery capacitance we just talked about, and uh, severe tricuspid valve regurgitation. But pulmonary artery pressure is not really so helpful, even though they're often very impressive numbers. Right heart catheterization, you need it. Um, the temptation may be to start uh, a patient on Bosantin uh, or a calcium antagonist uh, at an early stage, but really the indication for a calcium antagonist, for example, is in the patient who uh, has a uh, response to um, vasodilation at the time of right heart catheter with a 10% uh, or greater reduction in pulmonary artery uh, pressures and or 
the same uh, reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, so we've gone through a number of different drugs, uh, the development thereof. Um, epiprostanol has only been available uh, on this side of the Atlantic since 1995, though uh, with perhaps uh, a similar period of experience uh, since its discovery by um, Bain and others at Wellcome uh, back in the uh, 70s uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. So really a fairly large experience with that drug now. Um, and of course it is um, an analogue of a naturally occurring substance. Um, uh, Bosantin as an endothelial antagonist, Triprostanol as an analogue, uh, uh, a um, phosphodiesterase uh, uh, 5 inhibitor in the form of uh, the well-known sildenafil, uh, Iloprost, which is again just another analogue of uh, epiprostanol, uh, another endothelial antagonist, uh, and another one. And then, of course, the uh, notion of different routes by which you might administer these. Uh, Iloprost, for example, doesn't have to be inhaled. It can be given intravenously. All of these analogues of, of uh, epiprostanol can be given intravenously, but they can also be given uh, uh, by a uh, inhaled route. Um, as far as survival goes then, uh, this is where we were in 1981 to 85, prior to specific therapies here. Uh, this is after the introduction of epiprostanol, uh, and this is after the introduction of approved oral therapies. Uh, as a result, you really are looking at a much better natural history than the 2.8 years mean survi median survival, excuse me, that was uh, so... Uh, uh, sadly described in the uh, original NIH registry. Um, you now have, um, I think, reasonable recommendations uh, for patients who uh, have acute vasoreactivity, as we mentioned in right heart catheterization. Uh, those patients would typically get oral calcium channel blockers uh, and following the rich paper from the New England Journal would typically get uh, um, uh, uh, Coumadin as well, though the data for that is uh, really um, perhaps a little bit more questionable. Um, but typically we'll get anticoagulated as well for in situ thrombosis. Um, for uh, more advanced disease, uh, one would expect them to get um, uh, essentially um, some of the uh, more potent uh, endothelin inhibitor as, uh, and uh, arguably at this point uh, intervene with uh, uh, either epiprostanol or an analogue of epiprostanol. Um, the inhaled iloprost and the inhaled um, it has, to, has to be given um, six to nine times a day. It's, it's not a, an easy thing for a patient to tolerate, uh, although some people really prefer that to having the intravenous uh, indwelling line. Um, and of course, for the more severe grades, um, it's pretty much an automatic commencement on an, uh, an intravenous continuous agent, uh, and then consider atrial septostomy and uh, very much refer for transplantation. And I think actually, um, arguably, uh, think certainly at this stage also about the possibility of transplantation. Um, the NIH data is quite old. There is now a prospective study reveal uh, which, uh, amongst many other uh, uh, objectives, uh, Ray Benza uh, has developed um, and published uh, a year and a half ago now, uh, this um, grading system, point-based system, where we live in the, the era of point-based um, CHADs and CHAD2s, um, so we um, have the same thing in pulmonary hypertension now where we basically have a simple scoring system for the, uh, to try and determine the severity of the disease. Uh, and actually, it's pretty reliable in terms of splitting up um, more severe uh, classes of disease. And the higher scores have been demonstrated in prospective follow-up, admittedly only over a 12-month period so far, um, to be uh, associated with a worse outcome. 
So uh, that's functional class, which we talked about. This is a uh, functional class with reveal of uh, greater than eight. And um, this does give us some hope that we will be able to um, better separate out the uh, more severe patients. Um, so functional class four, um, six minute walks. Uh, we would suggest that this is really the group that you most definitely need to be considering uh, fairly uh, urgently for uh, lung transplantation um, or um, heart lung transplantation, depending on uh, the indices. Um, again, as mentioned, parenteral therapy here, uh, calcium channel blockers if positive vasodilator response, and of course, oral agents for the more mild disease, uh, and of course, combination therapy to consider, and as mentioned. So, better to combine the markers as much as you can, um, identify the high risk as, as uh, as uh, quickly and as uh, uh, efficiently as you can. Um, you know, it's difficult to know whether temporal changes are important. This is one of the conclusions of, of, uh, of the reveal or one of the suggestions of the reveal group. But um, again, I think we just need a little bit more data on that. Um, and. Unfortunately, it's true that although survival uh, has been greatly improved by these uh, agents, ultimately these patients are still going to need lung transplantation. It is true, however, that if you look at the survival, uh, at the number of transplants that are done for pulmonary hypertension, it used to be back in 1996, this is just the um, uh, International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation Registry, um, that a significant proportion, 30% of all heart lungs, are, are now almost never done operation, 11% of double lungs and 7.5% of all single lungs were primary pulmonary hypertension. Uh, now, uh, double lungs has halved and single lungs almost never done at all. So there's been a reduction in the number of patients who come forward. That's partly because they don't get the severity scores. It's partly because, of course, the natural history has also been changed in this condition. Uh, just a very brief word about thromboembolic disease. Here you see a typical um, example, or rather nice example, um, uh, of, of what's going on. You can see the complete occlusion uh, of uh, the pulmonary artery on the right side, and this uh, almost spider web-like structure that is sadly typical of thromboembolic disease. Um, what you're really trying to separate out are the patients who have more distal disease from the patients who have more proximal disease. Surgically, that would be described as uh, the, the more proximal disease would be stages one uh, to three. Stage four is typically the, the really quite distal disease. This is an example of what happens when you've got distal disease and you occlude your uh, wedge pressure. You get a very gradual correction by comparison with um, the occlusion pressure in someone with more proximal disease. But um, as you can probably surmise, it's not always possible to get a nice clean curve like that. And um, it's not always easy to make that separation. Uh, as far as transplantation goes, this is just our own uh, little figures. Um, you just. Uh, you actually do quite well with primary pulmonary hypertension. Um, uh, uh, this is heart-lung primary pulmonary hypertension. This is double-lung primary pulmonary hypertension. Unfortunately, our experience, as with many others, is if you're looking at secondary uh, pulmonary hypertension, particularly from scleroderma, the survival is significantly less favorable than that. So just some summary thoughts. Um, with new onset exertional dyspnea, if you've excluded everything else, if you've done your asthma workup, if you have no other reason um, to, uh, f you have no other cause, particularly in a younger patient, um, but in patients really of any age, think pulmonary hypertension, 
screen by a transthoracic echo, make the definitive if that shows pulmonary hypertension, and again, you have no other uh, reason uh, uh, for that which can be treated, please think about going fairly quickly to a right heart catheterization. And then, of course, um, initiation of treatment is also important, and we're just down the road, so don't forget about us either. <laughs> And so any questions? I may have missed it, but the, uh, the, the age at onset the curve. So the age of onset typically for pulmonary, primary pulmonary hypertension, typically the second to fourth decades for PPH. Um, again, um, family history is quite important in that regard. Um, it's not uncommon for a disease, it almost behaves like a triplet repeat, even though I, it's not known to be a triplet repeat disease, it, it almost always presents a little earlier uh, in subsequent generations, that tends to be the pattern. Um, so um, PPH that isn't obviously familial would tend to present it at that time and often around um, uh, uh, reproductive events, whether it's a, a, a pregnancy or not, and obviously overwhelmingly in women. Uh, for the broader disease, um, uh, add at least a decade, uh, and sometimes two, again, depending on which connective tissue disease or uh, other cause you're looking at. 